I hope this experience hasn't put any of you off flying. You've got me! Who's got you? Statistically speaking, it's still the safest way to travel. Superman just celebrated his 85th birthday. 85 years since he came down from Krypton to our little blue planet to fight for truth and justice. And over his hundreds of storylines, Superman has faced off against a whole host of villains. Everyone from his arch nemesis Lex Luthor to Darkseid to General Zod. Superman's also faced off against enemies that have been pulled in from the real world. But in 1946, Superman did something extraordinary. This is a history deep dive, and today we're taking a closer look at the story of how Superman took on the KKK and helped knock it on its sheet-covered, hate-filled, racist ass. So I think the best way to start this story is to do what a whole host of superhero tales before us have done, and that is to look at the villain's origin story. So the year is 1865, and America has just come through the bloodiest war in its history. The soldiers from both sides are returning to their home states, and in the state of Tennessee, six former Confederate officers get together to form a secret fraternal organization. The name they settle on for this organization is a combination of two words, the Greek word kuklus, meaning circle, and the word clan, Ku Klux Klan. The following years are full of every horrible thing you've heard about the clan, as, as Klansmen go out into the countryside and do everything they can to destroy black communities and instill fear in those who oppose them. Thousands of black people lose their lives and are driven from their homes. The violence of the KKK is relentless. And in 1870 and 71, Congress passes what's called the Enforcement Acts, which among other things, gives President Ulysses S. Grant the power to suspend habeas corpus and to send in federal troops to suppress the KKK, a power Grant uses to stop Klan violence and bring hundreds of Klansmen to trial. And surprisingly, the Klan membership begins to fall, so much so that by the end of the 1870s, the KKK has faded away almost entirely. But the Klan would not stay quiet for long. A man named William Joseph Simmons decides to relaunch the Klan, and he announces its rebirth with an enormous cross burning at Stone Mountain outside of Atlanta. His new clan grows to a few thousand members over the next several years, but Simmons wants to go bigger. So when the Klan launches its 100% Americanism campaign, membership explodes. By the mid-1920s, the KKK has as many as four million members, and it's not just in the South anymore. Some of the largest membership numbers come from states like Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New York. But there is one chink in the armor here, and that is that the Klan, in addition to its xenophobia, is also acting as the country's morality police, railing against everything from speakeasies to abortion to political corruption. And that becomes a problem when in the 1920s, several of their leaders are caught in embezzlement, conducting extramarital affairs, and most dramatically, in the case of the Grand Dragon of Indiana, the murder of a young school teacher. These scandals drive people out of the Klan, and membership numbers plummet almost as quickly as they climbed, leaving only the most militant involved as we roll into the 1930s and 40s. And that, my friends, brings us to Superman. In the sky, Chief. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, look, it's... Superman! Your name is Kal-El. You are the only survivor of the planet, Krypton. You will give the people of Earth an ideal to strive towards. Superman starts with two childhood friends from Cleveland, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, who are toying around with the idea of a superhero. So they've had some success in the past with writing some comic strips and submitting stories for sci-fi mags, but they're after that big one. I mean, they want to find that one character that's going to launch their careers into the stratosphere, the superpowered hero from another planet that we now know and love. So this is the Superman that they send out to the powers that be in the comics world. And then in 1938, folks at Detective Comics reach out and they expand their comic strip into a 13 page book and Superman is launched into the world in Action Comics number one in April of 1938. And it's a hit. So these men will continue to work for DC on and off for decades to come. And many of the aspects of the Superman saga will be done with little or no input from his creators, including the series The Adventures of Superman, which first hit the radio waves in February of 1940. Now, Superman's most famous radio storyline won't air until 1946. But before we get there, we do need to introduce one more character to our story, and he's kind of the linchpin of this whole thing. 
So this is Stetson Kennedy, and Kennedy is a writer and investigative journalist, and he hates the Klan. So by the 1940s, Kennedy's grown frustrated with simply writing about hate groups, and he wants to take real action to stop them. So he takes it upon himself to infiltrate the KKK at its heart in Atlanta, Georgia. And this gives Kennedy a front row seat to the next attempted revival of the Klan. In late 1945, the head of the Klan in Georgia, Samuel Dot Green, proclaims the return of the Klan with a series of cross-burning ceremonies on Stone Mountain the same location Simmons had begun the previous Klan wave 30 years earlier. Working with at least one other informant, Kennedy began to pull back the curtain on the inner workings of the Klan, and he makes two important discoveries. One is that the Klan is funneling a large portion of the money from membership fees, robes, and other Klan paraphernalia into the pockets of its leaders. But the other discovery Kennedy makes is just how silly Klan meetings and rituals are. The Klansmen interact with each other with a, a series of secret signs, countersigns, and handshakes. This gives Kennedy an idea. What if he could expose the inner workings of the Klan to a wider audience and demonstrate the foolishness of the men involved? So Kennedy reaches out to the producers of the Adventures of Superman radio program and offers to feed them inside information on the Klan. They would write the KKK in as an antagonist for Superman. The producers love the idea, and starting on June 10, 1946, Superman begins his battle with the Klan of the Fiery Cross, seated with intel from Stetson Kennedy. So here's the basic premise. The Clan of the Fiery Cross has turned its hatred on a Chinese-American boy named Tommy Lee and his family because Tommy has replaced a white kid as the starting pitcher for the local baseball team. Superman must save Tommy and his family from kidnappings, a bicycle bomb, drowning, and a sniper's bullets, among other things. But in the end, the Clan and its leader, the Grand Scorpion, are brought to justice, and Superman, Jimmy Olsen, and friends are off on their next great adventure. Yes. Admittedly, it's a little hokey to our modern ears, but the show did several important things. The first is that at several points, Superman equates the actions and ideals of this Klan with the Nazis. The program also showed the Klan's pursuit of the almighty dollar through a scene in which the head of the National Klan lectures the Grand Scorpion on jeopardizing the membership drive with his foolish violent pursuit of the Lee family. And finally, and probably most importantly, the show exposes the foolishness of the men who are suckered into the ideals of the Klan. Kennedy reports that in the week Superman vs. the Clan of the Fiery Cross was on the air, Klansmen wanted to talk about little else. The men were increasingly irritated with how they were being portrayed. Some expressed embarrassment at having come home to find neighborhood kids dressed up in bed sheets and capes playing Superman vs. the Klan, and others were afraid of what their own children might think if they discovered their Klan robes and hood. According to Kennedy, membership attendance in his clavern fell precipitously over the course of the program and never recovered. This radio program was wildly popular with its target audience, and it even received accolades from social justice advocates of the time for its ability to show children the evils of bigotry and its encouragement to treat everyone as equals regardless of race, nationality, or religion. I think it could even be argued that the Clan of the Fiery Cross was the first program to demonstrate to corporate sponsors of the time that these radio shows could be about more than just entertainment, but they could be used in the fight for social justice, a fight comic book stories of all forms continue to this day. This third wave of the Klan never materializes, and while they would rise to public consciousness again in the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s, the Klan would never again reach the heights of power it had in the 20s and 30s. And while there are certainly many others who deserve credit in socking it to the Klan, I certainly like to think that Superman, the ultimate immigrant from another planet, played at least a small role in the downfall of one of the most hateful villains in American history.